There's a passage in the canon where a prince comes to the Buddha with a trick question. Would the Buddha ever say anything displeasing to other people? And the trick of the question was this. If the Buddha said, yes, then you could respond, well, how are you different from anybody else? What's so awakened about you? And if he said no, they could catch him in a lie, because he had said some displeasing things to his cousin who had tried to take over the Sangha, called him a lickspittle, one of those great words that we somehow have lost. <laughs> so the prince comes to him, sits down. He has his baby son on his lap. The idea being that if the conversation gets to a difficult spot where the prince suddenly finds himself in a bad spot, he'll pinch the baby. The baby will cry, and that'll put an end to the discussion. And this is one of those cases where the Buddha realized that this is not a question you give a straight answer to. And so that's what he says. There's no categorical answer to that. Instead, he gives an analytical answer. But before he does that, he gives a counter question. So suppose your baby son swallowed a piece of glass. I think back in those days they had shards of pottery, so a shard from a piece of pottery. Suppose he put it in his mouth. What would you do? And the prince said, well, I'd crook my finger and get it out of his mouth, even if it meant drawing blood, because that would be better than the, what would happen if you allowed the kid to swallow it. And it was said in the same way. There are times when you have to say displeasing things to head people off from something even more dangerous. And then he gave his analytical answer. He says, before saying something, the Buddha would consider, one, is it true? Two, is it beneficial? Three, is it timely? And only if it passed all three questions would he say it. This is an important principle to keep in mind when we read the Buddha's teachings and try to apply them in our own practice. There are lots of true things in the sutta. Sometimes they Oh, seem to be working at cross purposes to one another. So you have to figure out which particular teaching is timely for you. And this is an important principle to keep in mind all the way across the board as we practice. Basically, the Buddha is thinking like a doctor. He's got medicine, and it's genuine medicine. And it's to be careful that the medicine really is beneficial. But there are times when one medicine might be good for you, and it may not be good for you at another time. Years back I went to India, came back to Thailand, and had to be hospitalized with malaria. And they discovered that along with the malaria I picked up Jodiasis in India. So they gave me medicine from Roche, the, the Swiss drug maker. And after a couple of weeks in the hospital, the malaria case subsided. But I still had the problem with the Jodiasis. John Fung had a couple of nurses as students, so I asked them to what I should do. And they said, well, first thing is let's check the medicine. One of the nurses had a friend who worked in a pharmaceutical organization. And she came back and she said, that was cornstarch. It wasn't even genuine medicine. So that's the first lesson. You want to make sure that the medicine is genuine medicine, and that it's really beneficial. There are some chemicals that are genuine, but they're not going to help you. And even then, you have to think about, is this the right time to give this medicine? So this is what the Buddha's teachings are. They're intended as medicine. The Buddha often talked of himself as a doctor, treating the ills of people's minds. 
but the doctor has gone away. But he has left his medical textbooks for you to train yourself to be your own physician. This is part of the wisdom of the, the suttas, is we have to see the Buddha in action, seeing what kind of person he would apply, what kind of teaching to, what the circumstances would be. So you get some, some idea about it. He wasn't the sort of person who was like a college professor trying to set out an outline, this is the truth, and it's all a neat, tidy system. Instead, he was offering medicines and trying to give you some idea of when and where to apply them. This is why it's important to have a teacher as you practice, because hopefully the teachers picked up some sense of the right time and the right place for different teachings. And so by hanging around the teacher, you begin to get a sense of that as well. But there's a lot of it that depends on your own powers of observation. And remember that even some of the teachings that may seem very abstract are intended as medicine. For example, the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception fabrication and consciousness. This is the Buddha's analysis of suffering. When you suffer, there is going to be clinging to one of these five things. And so it's useful to look at whatever the suffering is, whether it's an uncomfortable experience in the body or an uncomfortable state of mind or both of them together. Try to take it apart into its components to see which part is the problem. Are you clinging to a particular sense of the form of the body? Are you clinging to a particular feeling? Now, clinging here may mean holding on to it, not so much because you like it, but because you're entangled in it. Because sometimes you cling to painful feelings because you want to change them. Then there's perception. How do you perceive the situation? What labels are you applying to this? And are they helpful? Fabrication. What stories are you creating around the situation? And then there's just simple, the simple consciousness that's aware of these things through the eye or the ear or the nose or the tongue or the body. Or simply through the mind. So these are meant to be used as medicine, this, this form of analysis. So you can take these things apart so they're not so overwhelming. Instead of being faced with this huge cliff of rock, this huge mass of suffering, you divide it up into little bits of gravel. And you say, oh, it's simply because I was perceiving it in a particular way that caused the problem. This is why we spend so much time in concentration practice, because as the Buddha says, concentration is a perception attainment. You learn how to hold a particular perception in mind, and you try to sort through all the possible perceptions you can apply to what you're experiencing right now and find that if there's one that you can settle down with and have a sense of ease. So when things are hellish in your body or hellish in your mind, you might say, start questioning your perceptions. Can you replace those perceptions with other ones? If there's a perception of pain, you can ask yourself, okay, where is the pleasure here? Because pain, excuse me, pain and pleasure are intertwined. As one of the Buddha's nun disciples, Sister Dhammadina, said this, pleasure is pleasant in remaining and painful in changing. Pain is painful in remaining and pleasant in changing. So even in pain, there's going to be some aspect of pleasure. Try to look for it. The perception is what opens up the possibility in your mind. That even in the midst of pain, there can be some pleasure. Let's look for that. When the body seems like a big mass of rock, remind yourself, okay, there's energy flowing through the body. 
There's space between all the atoms. Try to hold that perception in mind. When the breath seems difficult, remind yourself that there already is breath energy in the body. What you feel of the body right now is breath energy flowing, so it's already flowing. Maybe in your effort to breathe in a particular way based on your perception of how the breath should go, you're actually blocking a more comfortable way of breathing, or a more comfortable way of the breath flowing through the body. In other words, try to see what perception is most helpful, most soothing, what perception can be your medicine right now. Those three perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not-self, those are intended in the same way. As the sutta we chanted just now says, these things are true. But then the next question comes, okay, are they beneficial right now? Is this a timely time to be thinking about them? What's the best way to apply them? It's like a medicine. Is this a medicine that you should eat or rub on your skin, or should you have it injected into your blood? When something th seems difficult, sometimes it's good to remind yourself this is inconstant, and not the fact that it's going to end in a couple hours or in a couple years, but it's actually changing right now. It's unstable right now. So where the Buddhist teachings on the elements is helpful. You've got a pain in the body. Remind yourself, okay, body sensations are of a certain type, what they call the four elements. Earth, water, wind, fire. A sense of solidity, liquidity, movement, and warmth. And the pain is something else. As I said before, we have a tendency to glom the pain onto the solid part, so the pain seems solid. The pain's not solid. It's a feeling tone. Solid is, some, is form. Try to distinguish between the two. Not because some book says that this is what reality is, but as the Buddha said, these are useful perceptions for dividing things up. That's what discernment is. It's learning, one, how to divide things up, and then to, to see what happens when you do. So you can see which form of perception is really helpful right now, when it's timely to apply it. Because even though the three perceptions are, as the Buddha said, true, there are times when they're not actually all that timely. When you're practicing concentration, you'd want to say, well, everything is stressful and not self, so I might as well not try. That's not the right time to use that medicine. At that point, you want to focus on how constant you can make your state of mind, how pleasant you can make it, and how much you can bring it under your control. Because when the Buddha talks about issues of self, we tend to think of the self as a thing, but he saw it more as a type of activity. You make a sense of mind, you make a sense of I. And there are times when your eye and your mind can be skillful and times when they're not. And particularly the, the type of activity that creates a sense of self is where you have a sense of control. That's self-activity or selfing. And you do have a certain measure of control. You can decide you're going to focus on the breath, you can decide you're going to wander away. You can train yourself to get better at this. Now, there are limits on the amount of control that you can exert, but you learn to, pl you learn to play within the limits, move them in the direction where you want them to go. And you apply the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not self to any thoughts that would pull you away. And also to when it's appropriate to give yourself a sense of patience. Okay, you can't totally control this. You've got to learn how to figure out how to cause, how do cause and effect work right now. And what can you, how can you use them to your advantage? So as you meditate here, think of yourself as a medical student. You're learning to become a doctor for your own mind. 
the medicines are all laid out. First you want to make sure they are genuine medicines, that they are true. And then secondly, are they beneficial for you? And then thirdly, is this the right time for them? And try to get a sense through practice which perceptions, which ways of looking at things are useful for the particular problem right now. Because if you just sit with what's there, like a big lump, it may go away after a while, but you don't really learn anything. You learn a little bit of patience. But you may also learn that you develop a dislike for the meditation, having to sit with these big lumps and these big boulders of suffering. So try, start trying to apply the Buddha's perceptions, the Buddha's medicine, to that boulder. See where you can start taking it apart. See where it already is not a boulder, that it's really something else, if you look at it in a different way. This way you learn the power of perception, and you get practice in how to practice medicine for the mind. Because it's only through hands-on experience with learning how to direct the mind in new ways, like this, that you can finally get to the mind at a place where it doesn't need any more medicine. At that point, the Buddha says you're beyond training. You don't really need his dharma anymore. As long as the mind still has its suffering, still has its greed, anger, and delusions, it needs medicine. He provides the medicine, and it's up to us to figure out when it's beneficial, when it's timely, and how to apply it to the specific diseases we're suffering right now. <laughs>